Okay, here we are now into chapter four, chemical bonds of our text. So another uh, big idea in chemistry is the nature of the chemical bond and the different types of chemical bonds that we'll be able to encounter. So after this chapter, you'll have a much better idea about uh, chemistry and bonding and uh, how uh, matter uh, changes uh, from form to form through uh, the breaking and making of chemical bonds. Okay, so as usual, we have a number of learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, first, we'll determine the number of electrons in an ion. We'll be able to write the Lewis symbol for an atom or ion uh, and distinguish between an ion and an atom. Uh, we already hinted at that previously, but now we'll make that a very clear distinction. Uh, we'll describe the nature of the attraction that leads to formation of an ionic bond. Uh, one of the types of bonds that we'll encounter, and we'll write symbols for common ions and determine their charges. We'll also describe the relationship between the octet rule and the charge on an ion. Uh, we'll name and write formulas for binary ionic compounds, binary meaning just two uh, different elements involved. Uh, we can have ternary and uh, higher level, but uh, we'll focus on binary first. Uh, we'll explain the difference between a covalent bond and an ionic bond, and of course that's going to have to do with the electrons and, and how they interact. Uh, we'll name and write formulas for covalent compounds uh, and see how that differs from ionic compounds. And then we'll uh, classify a covalent bond as either polar or nonpolar. Tying in with that idea of polar versus nonpolar, we'll use electronegativities of elements to determine bond polarity. We'll predict the number of bonds formed by common nonmetals, so what we'll call the HONC rules. Uh, we'll recognize common polyatomic ions and be able to use them in naming and writing formulas for compounds. We'll uh, be able to write Lewis formulas for simple molecules and simple polyatomic ions. Uh, and we'll also identify the presence of free radicals, uh, which occur from time to time. All right, finally, we'll predict the shapes of simple molecules from their Lewis formulas. Uh, we'll uh, classify a simple molecule as polar or nonpolar from its shape and from that polarity of the bonds that we discussed as an early learning objective. Uh, we'll explain how shape and composition change the properties of molecules. We'll describe the concept of molecular recognition. And finally, we'll explain the green chemistry advantage of using production methods based on molecular recognition. Okay, so looking at carbon as a good example, uh, carbon exists commonly as soot. So it's, uh, you know, a dark, uh, soft material. Uh, but if that soot is subjected to high temperature and pressure, it can form diamonds, which are uh, the hardest material known. They're also uh, in the very pure state, uh, essentially colorless, they'll separate light into its colors, but the diamond itself is colorless. Uh, uh, sometimes impurities give uh, colors like yellow or uh, blue, and that can either make a, a diamond less valuable uh, or more valuable, uh, depending on the particular uh, buyer and what they're looking for. Um, so how do we get soot, that soft, dark material, uh, to become something very hard and uh, essentially colorless, uh, well it has to do with the bonding, it has to do with how carbon bonds with itself and, and the different forms of carbon that are possible uh, based on how those uh, chemical bonds hold the atoms together. All right, so one of the trends we see in chemistry is uh, that of stable electron configurations for the noble gases, that very last column uh, in the modern periodic table uh, helium, and so on and so forth. Well, these noble gases are inert. They don't do a lot of chemistry. Uh, helium and neon uh, do essentially no chemistry. Um, argon, I think, may have been forced into one or two compounds. And then as you get larger on down, uh, we've been able to force under very unusual conditions, high pressure, high temperature, using fluorine gas or oxygen gas or a combination of the two, we've been able to force some reaction among the lower members of that group. But uh, by and large, they're uh, chemically inert. They don't undergo chemical reactions as a rule. So uh, that's an interesting feature of them, and they went undiscovered for a long time because of that. They were hiding in plain sight. Uh, since they were doing no chemistry, they were uh, just overlooked for a long, long time. 
Uh, and so once we discovered the noble gases and uh, noticed that trend, uh, we had the theory uh, to back it up. Uh, well, why do we observe that fact of uh, little, if any, reaction? Well, uh, theoretically, it, it deals with the electronic structure of the noble gases. Uh, each of them has a filled octet uh, in their outermost shell, uh, helium being the exception. It just has a filled duet. The 1s orbital is doubly occupied. Uh, in all other cases, you have the NS, N being the principal energy level for which the noble gas occurs. So NS2, NP6, uh, that's where we get the octet, the two electrons from the P sublevel and the six electrons from the, I'm sorry, the two electrons from the S sublevel and the two, six electrons from the P sublevel uh, coming together to give us eight valence electrons. So from that theory, we can deduce that elements become less reactive when they alter their electron structures to have that of a noble gas. So if we look at sodium metal, a very reactive element uh, in the first column of the periodic table, uh, well, sodium uh, being in that first column has just one electron in its 3s sublevel. So if sodium would uh, lose that electron, then it would go back to having the uh, 10 electrons uh, in the same arrangement as a neon atom. So uh, sodium uh, is quite reactive. It's looking to give up that electron, uh, that extra electron, the one electron in its 3s orbital, so that it can uh, go down to the 10 electrons uh, that neon has, having a filled 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 arrangement. Uh, however, being sodium, uh, it now has still 11 protons in its nucleus, right? The protons determine the element, so since we're still dealing with sodium, by changing the electron count, we haven't changed the nucleus at all. So we still have 11 protons, and now we only have 10 electrons to balance those 11 positive charges, uh, and that therefore we result in an overall charge on the sodium ion of plus 1. So ions are electrically charged. Sodium, by losing that one electron from its atomic state, now becomes the sodium ion, Na plus 1. Now if we go to the other end of the table, just one space to the left of the noble gases, we find chlorine. And chlorine, uh, therefore, has a, uh, an, a valence electron configuration of uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2, 3p5, so it's almost there to be like argon. It's missing just one electron to fill that uh, p sublevel and have that stable octet. So chlorine can gain an electron, just like sodium atom lost an electron to become the sodium plus one ion. Uh, the chlorine atom can gain one electron to become the chloride minus one ion. Again, the reason we're a minus one here is we've gained an electron to have a total of 18 electrons being chlorine, uh, or chloride in this case, we still have just 17 positive charges in the nucleus. So we have an overall uh, minus one charge because we have the 18 electrons balanced only by 17 protons. So uh, as you saw with sodium, metals tend to lose one or more electrons to gain the noble gas configuration of the noble gas that comes before that element, uh, whereas nonmetals tend to gain electrons uh, until they have the same electron count as the noble gas that follows that nonmetal element. So the idea of gaining and losing electrons is vital to the understanding of ionic substances, um, but it's a bit unwieldy with those uh, chemical pictures. So uh, the Lewis electron dot symbol system was developed by G.N. Lewis to uh, make it easier to represent these things. So we take the valence electrons uh, and we fill them as dots around the element symbol uh, to have a, a easier, more convenient uh, approach compared with what we just saw on the previous slides. So we see here a number of uh, Lewis electron dot symbols for uh, select main group elements. Uh, and again, uh, sometimes you'll see them separated. Uh, other times they'll be paired, especially group 2A. Um, so uh, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, they all end in NS2, so you'd expect those two electrons to be paired. 
Uh, in the case of beryllium, we keep them separate for an important reason as we'll talk about later in this chapter, uh, and that's the sorts of bonds that beryllium can make. But for the rest of that uh, column, we could have had those uh, two dots easily paired, uh, like you see uh, to the left of uh, the nitrogen in group 5A. And so you see we have a nice convenient way of representing valence electrons. Notice it's only the valence electrons. That's not all the electrons in the potassium atom, for instance. It has lots more electrons in lower energy states. We just show the valence electrons, the NS and NP sublevels. So if we think back to our example of sodium uh, losing one electron to become the sodium ion and chlorine gaining one electron to become the chloride ion, uh, we can uh, support the fact that sodium reacts with chlorine. If we look at the uh, images in A, you have a chunk of sodium metal and you have a, uh, a sealed glass tube with chlorine gas, um, both of which are very, very toxic to a human life. Uh, chlorine was used as a war gas in World War I and uh, unfortunately caused a, a lot of deaths as a result. Um, if we look at B, we see the chlorine and sodium reacting very violently, giving off lots of uh, energy as heat and light. Uh, and when those two unstable, reactive, uh, deadly uh, elements come together, uh, now we have C, uh, a picture of good old table salt, sodium chloride. So you take uh, two elements, each of which is toxic to human life alone, uh, when they're combined uh, in such a way that the sodium atoms uh, can lose their electron uh, and the chloride, chlorine atom can gain an electron from each sodium atom to become chloride, now you have a very stable uh, substance uh, that uh, we use uh, pretty much on a daily basis. So uh, it's amazing that those elements, uh, just by transferring that one electron, uh, go from being unstable and uh, potentially deadly to uh, being relatively harmless. I say relatively, of course, because... Um, many of us consume too much table salt, and, and that has its problems, but uh, essentially you can consume a lot more table salt than you could uh, sodium or chlorine in the elemental form. And here we see that same idea as uh, atomic pictures. We have the sodium atom, which has that 11th electron, that 3s1 electron that uh, really uh, makes it unstable. You have the chlorine atom having the 3s2, 3p5 electron configuration. Uh, and so if they're able to uh, transfer that electron, sodium uh, loses it and chlorine gains it, uh, then now you have stable ions that have uh, the same electron configuration as uh, the noble gases. Uh, in the case of sodium, it's the same electron configuration as neon now, 10 electrons total. In the case of chloride, it's the same electron configuration as uh, argon, uh, the uh, noble gas that follows it. Uh, but in both cases, now you have stable electron configurations. You have a stable compound. You need the same number of chloride ions as sodium ions because they do need to cancel each other out. The chloride has that minus one to balance out sodium's plus one. So overall, the compound is stable and neutral. Uh, but individually, those ions are charged, and we do have to account for that. Uh, but a, a very different situation, electronically speaking, than the free atoms. So in nature, we're obviously dealing with many more than one sodium atom and one chlorine atom. We're dealing with uh, many, many billions upon billions of these things. And so uh, when the sodium ions and chloride ions, which are absolutely uh, oppositely charged come together, they attract each other in three dimensions. And so this is uh, what we call an ionic bond. It extends in three dimensions. And these ionic compounds are held together by the ionic bonds uh, and are ex typically exist in a crystal lattice. Not every uh, compound uh, is crystalline, but we tend to see uh, crystalline uh, layouts and we tend to see that uh, we pack together as many uh, positive charges around negative charges as we can. So it's, it's maybe a little tough to see in that picture, but you get a cubic arrangement here, which is why you get cubes of salts. Sodium chloride table salt uh, tends to form these cubic uh, layouts because they're actually arranged in a cubic lattice. Uh, and uh, the uh, sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride ions, and then each chloride ion is surrounded by six sodium ions. Uh, and it goes on and on. Uh, 
infinitely in three dimensions obviously not not forever because there is a terminus to that crystal uh, but there's a lot of ions involved it's not just a discrete uh, case where we have one sodium ion and one chloride ion we have many many of each in a single crystal a single grain of sodium chloride okay and something that we'll talk about uh, in a few moments in more detail uh, when we talk about um, metals versus metal ions we don't make a distinction in the name so uh, this can lead to a lot of misconceptions misunderstandings in everyday life so we see here the um, bottle of calcium uh, as a dietary supplement. Well, if you look uh, below it, you see calcium metal, which is a, a silvery uh, type of metal. It's reactive with water. It's, it's not very stable to air. Uh, so it's far, far too dangerous for us to consume calcium metal. So when we see uh, at the drugstore a, a bottle labeled calcium, it's typically calcium carbonate. It's calcium ions bound in a crystal lattice to carbonate ions, one of the polyatomic ions we'll talk about shortly. Uh, and, and it's a misconception that people have that calcium is this white powdery substance. It's not. Calcium carbonate is. Calcium metal is not. So the free atom, calcium uh, in its metallic state, is, is another one of those examples like sodium or chlorine. That's an element that's uh, deadly to humans. Uh, but uh, we tend to generalize when we say calcium, we tend not to say the other component of the calcium salt, like calcium carbonate or calcium citrate that you might buy at the uh, drugstore. Uh, if we look at iron, uh, iron pills uh, that you would also buy at a pharmacy uh, tend to be ferrous sulfate. So they uh, tend to have that w uh, yellowish color. Um, and they're pressed into tablets, uh, and they're not pure iron. Pure iron, as we know, is that dark metallic substance that responds to uh, a magnetic field and all that good stuff. Uh, so obviously the iron as ferrous sulfate, which is iron uh, ion, iron that's lost two electrons in this case, uh, and now is sharing uh, its space, its crystal lattice with sulfate ions, another polyatomic ion we'll talk about, uh, this is a very different situation than when people think they're going to buy iron and calcium. You're not getting the elements, you're getting these uh, salts that are formed from the elements. And the salts are stable and the salts are, are uh, useful uh, to us biochemically, whereas the free metals typically uh, could be either uh, dangerous in, in large amounts. Iron metal isn't too bad if, if you get a little bit, but a lot is bad. Uh, calcium, even in small amounts, as metal, would be very dangerous. Okay, so moving back to that octet rule. Uh, again, octet meaning eight. Uh, in chemical reactions, atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons in such a way that they have eight valence electrons. That's what we call the octet rule. Uh, and it's it has a few important exceptions, but as a general rule of thumb, it's a pretty good guiding principle uh, for determining how... Uh, the elements will combine to make a stable compound. They tend to combine in such a way that either uh, they become ions with uh, eight valence electrons each, or they share so that each sort of has an octet uh, if they're going to make a molecular compound. So the octet rule is a very good guiding principle, although as I already mentioned, it's not without its exceptions, and we'll talk about uh, a couple of those uh, by the end of this chapter. So as I mentioned with the octet rule, uh, atoms tend to either gain, lose, or share electrons to achieve that octet. Uh, in the case of metals, it's typical that a metal will lose electrons to uh, take on the electronic structure of the uh, previous noble gas, and therefore they form positive ions, right? They have the same number of protons in the nucleus, but they've lost some electrons, so they're going to have a net positive charge of either plus one, plus two, plus three, so on and so forth. And we call these positively charged ions cations. In the case of nonmetals, uh, nonmetals would tend to gain electrons to take on the same electronic structure as the noble gas that follows them. So uh, because they still have the same number of protons they start with, they're not changing their identity in terms of what element you're dealing with. They're just gaining electrons and staying the same uh, element. Uh, that will give a net negative charge. So if we're looking at a chemical reaction between metals and nonmetals, like with sodium and chlorine, 
uh, or with calcium and carbonate. Uh, well, what we'll have is uh, an ionic bond forming, and it forms by the metals losing electrons uh, until they achieve the noble gas configuration that preceded them, uh, and we'll have the nonmetals gaining electrons uh, until they achieve the noble gas configuration that follows them. So in an ionic substance, we're made up of ions, cations, which were neutral metals that have lost electrons, and uh, anions, which are uh, nonmetals that have gained uh, a certain number of electrons. So here we see a table with some examples uh, for the octet rule and uh, the very first one from group 1A, hydrogen is an exception to the octet rule, right? Hydrogen has just that one electron in its 1s orbital, so a 1s1 configuration. Uh, if it loses that one electron, it's now just a proton. So sometimes we'll call it a hydrogen ion, sometimes we'll just refer to it as a proton because most of the time, uh, hydrogen has just that one electron outside the nucleus and the one proton within. We mentioned in a previous chapter that there's other isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, but they make up a relatively small amount of the hydrogen that occurs in nature. So um, chances are the hydrogen that you're dealing with is protium, uh, and if that hydrogen atom loses an electron, now it's just a proton. So we'll see in a later chapter that H plus is another symbol for a proton. Uh, lithium as well. Lithium didn't achieve an octet, right? It lost its 2s uh, electron, the one electron in its 2s orbital, to gain a 1s2 configuration. So it's a stable duet, just like helium. Uh, but uh, once we go further, obviously sodium now follows the octet rule and potassium and so on and so forth. So early on we have some exceptions to the octet rule, but uh, by and large, the, most of the time, the octet rule is obeyed. So if we're dealing with ionic compounds, uh, we, we've already mentioned that uh, metals tend to lose electrons to become cations, non-metals tend to gain electrons to become anions. Uh, well, from this information and from the overall charges, we can uh, get an idea of how we would write a chemical formula for a neutral ionic compound, uh, and also how we would name uh, a neutral ionic compound. And we'll start with the simplest example, what we call binary ionic compounds, binary meaning just two uh, types of atoms involved, two elements, a, a metal and a non-metal. So uh, in the case of the cation, the charge of the cation uh, comes from the representative elements, the main group elements, those first two columns and last, two, uh, last six columns on uh, the periodic table uh, are what we call the main group or the representative elements. And so the uh, charge for the uh, metals tends to be the same as the column number as long as we skip that middle group of transition metals. So if you think about group one having lithium and sodium and so forth, and group two having beryllium and magnesium, uh, then if we skip all the way over to uh, the boron family, uh, and instead of group 13, if we call that group 3A, and then group 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A, you can see from those eight groups, we have the main group's elements, and the metals would have the charge of whatever group it is. So if sodium would have a plus one because it's in group 1A, uh, aluminum would have a plus three because it's in group 3A. So it's pretty easy to predict the charge on the cation and uh, also the name of the cation is simply the name of the element. We talked about this with calcium and iron for instance. Uh, we don't buy calcium metal at the pharmacy. Uh, we go to the vitamin and mineral section and we buy calcium carbonate, but we simply refer to it as calcium. So again, the name of the cation is the same as the name of the element, uh, but we understand it's an ion. So in the example is shown on the slide, we have Na+, that's the sodium ion as opposed to the sodium metal. Uh, magnesium 2 plus is the magnesium ion as opposed to magnesium metal, for instance. So they're no longer the elements. They've lost electrons, one or more, sodium loses one, magnesium loses two, aluminum loses three, uh, to become ions. Uh, things get a little more complicated, not too much, uh, but a little more complicated for the anions. So if we look at the charge of an anion, we look at what group it's in, again, uh, just ignoring the uh, 10 columns of uh, transition metals that occur in the middle of the table, uh, and from that group uh, number, if we take the group number uh, or family number minus eight, we'll get the charge on the ion. 
Uh, so for instance, if we skip down to the bottom now, we see Cl minus. Well, chlorine's in group 7A or 17. Uh, and if we take 7 minus 8 or 17 minus 18, we get a negative 1. Uh, likewise, oxygen, uh, which is in group 6A or 16, uh, and we take 16 minus 18 or 6 minus 8, we get a negative 2 charge. If we move even another uh, group to the left, we'd have nitrogen. And nitrogen is in group 5A or 15, uh, and therefore we'd assume it to have a minus 3 charge. 5 minus 8 would be minus 3, or 15 minus 18 would be minus 3. So it's a little more involved to get the anion charge because we do have to, to uh, do a little math. Uh, not as easy as the cation charge, but uh, not bad. Uh, the other difference is we take uh, the root name of the element uh, and uh, give it an IDE suffix to get the name of the anion. This is nice because then you don't have that confusion like you do with metal ions having the same name as the metal element. Uh, well, for the nonmetal, it's clear that you have something different. So instead of chlorine ion, we call it the chloride ion and the oxide ion. If you look at the nitrogen example, it would be nitride ion. So as you practice these things in your homework sets uh, and just uh, working through the examples in the text, uh, you'll get more and more familiar with what the root name is uh, because it's not always predictable. But typically it's uh, most of the name of the atom and then an IDE ending. So once you master these rules for naming the uh, anions and cations, um, then to name the overall compound is just simply naming the ions that make it up. So in the case of binary compounds, uh, if we have NaCl, uh, we have the sodium ion and the chloride ion coming uh, together to give sodium chloride. Uh, for the case of MgO, we have magnesium oxide. So uh, not too bad, relatively simple. Um, if we had, uh, say, magnesium chloride, which would be uh, a little more difficult, we'd need two chloride ions for the one magnesium ion because of charge. So we will have to deal with charge issues, uh, and, and we just have to make sure that we have enough of uh, each type of ion to give an overall zero charge. And we'd always want to have the lowest whole number ratio. So we'd never have Na2Cl2 uh, because for an ionic compound, we can always just reduce it to NaCl. But if we had magnesium chloride, for instance, it would be MgCl2 because that's the simplest state we could get it to. Now, things have been pretty simple with the metals, right? It's been easy to predict their charge and their name if we stick with the main group. Um, things get a little trickier uh, if we deal with the transition metals or some of the uh, lower members of the main group, uh, elements like lead and tin. Uh, because uh, those metals can have different ionic charges when they lose their electrons. So the way that we make that distinction is with Roman numerals. Uh, and hopefully you know your Roman numerals from American movies. Uh, it's about the only other time we use them uh, frequently in modern society. But uh, here in chemistry, they're invaluable because they really help us to distinguish between uh, two metal ions that have the same element name but a different charges. So for the examples we see here, we have the Fe2 plus that we call the iron 2 ion uh, compared to the Fe3 plus, which is the iron 3 ion. Uh, there were also uh, older ways of doing it. This is the modern naming system. Uh, in the old nomenclature, we would call the iron 2 ion the ferrous ion. Uh, and the iron 3 ion, the ferric ion. So that IC ending for the higher charge, the OUS ending for the lower charge. Uh, and you'll st still see that from time to time, especially if you think back a few slides to the um, iron pills, uh, you noticed it was called ferrous sulfate. So uh, iron 2 sulfate would be the preferred name. For copper, you have copper 2 plus being the copper 2 ion, copper 1 plus being the copper 1 ion. Uh, and again, the copper 2 plus uh, used to be called cupric, and the copper 1 plus used to be called cuprus. Uh, but we've abandoned that uh, old system uh, to now go with the Roman numerals, giving the charge on the ion. 
And if we look at this periodic table here, they show a number of the commonly encountered ions. So you see most of them are in the main group and you have the group one metal ions that all have the plus one charge, the lower group two metal ions starting with magnesium, which all have the two plus charge. Uh, you have aluminum in group three that has three plus charge. So uh, those metals tend to be predictable. Uh, aside from those transition elements, as we see, the iron ion, for instance, can be iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. So we have to distinguish that in the name by putting the Roman numeral 2 for the iron 2 plus or 3 for the iron 3 plus because we can't just call it iron sulfate uh, or iron chloride. You don't know which iron ion you have. Uh, likewise with copper. Copper could be 1 plus or 2 plus. So we would put the Roman numeral. Silver, we commonly encounter it in the 1 plus state, uh, but it can hold other uh, oxidation numbers. So uh, we would typically use the Roman numeral there as well. So we'd have silver 1 chloride, for instance. Zinc doesn't take on any other uh, oxidation state than plus 2. So you wouldn't need to say zinc 2 oxide. You would just call it zinc oxide. Even though zinc occurs at that end of the transition metal block there, uh, it doesn't have uh, multiple oxidation states, so we don't have to worry about its charge. Uh, you see for the uh, commonly encountered uh, non-metal ions, the anions there, nitride, phosphide, oxide, sulfide, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, uh, they all have that root uh, of the uh, element name and then the IDE ending to give us uh, the anion name. So ionic bonds that we've been discussing, they're characterized by a transfer of electrons. The uh, metal uh, atom loses one or more electrons to become the metal ion, even though its name doesn't change, it is an ion now. And in certain instances like uh, iron or copper, we have to use the Roman numeral because there are a couple different possibilities. For uh, the nonmetals, they gain one or more electrons to become the uh, anion, the negatively charged ion, and that is distinguished by uh, the IDE ending on the root name of the element. Uh, so that's ionic bonding for us. Uh, the naming is, is actually fairly simple. Uh, now we'll talk about covalent bonds where there isn't a full transfer of electrons. There's a sharing of electrons among elements. Uh, and uh, as we'll see, that, that gives its own special rules for naming and uh, uh, for uh, the type of chemistry that we would expect. So these tend to occur between nonmetal elements. So two or more nonmetallic elements uh, share their electrons rather than gaining or losing. Uh, and when they share in that way, they're able to each have an octet some of the time. So we call this shared pair of electrons a covalent bond. Uh, and atoms can commonly form one, two, or three pair of electron sharings to give single, double, or triple bonds. Uh, we also have quadruple and even quintuple bonds uh, that are uh, quite rare and happen with uh, metals. And I uh, just wanted to let you know that things do get really interesting, and hopefully uh, this course will give you enough interest in chemistry that you uh, hang on and take some of those higher level courses and, and find out some of this new and different stuff that's happening. But uh, for those of you who are uh, essentially done with college chemistry after this course, then the single, double, and triple bond is really uh, all that you'll be exposed to. So binary compounds, uh, instead of um, having the, the uh, rules where we just talk about the element names, uh, like in ionic cases, uh, for binary covalent compounds, we use a prefix to talk about the number of, of each type of atom present. And so the prefixes we use are uh, largely Greek. So you see the prefix for one is mono, two is di, three is tri, four is tetra, five is penta, six is hexa, seven is hepta, eight is octa, 9 is Nona, and 10 is Deca. So those are how we uh, will uh, give the prefix for uh, elements that have that number. We won't deal with anything that has more than 10. Uh, we'll do some biochem where we have lots and lots of atoms, and we have special names there, but uh, largely we'll deal with 10 or fewer uh, atoms involved in these binary uh, covalent compounds. All right, so if we look at the rules, binary covalent compounds have two names. So that's always a two-word name, I suppose we should say. 
the first word in the name uh, comes from the prefix and name of that first element. Uh, and uh, we have our convention, right? We teach you the rules and then we break them. Uh, well, uh, if the first element has only one atom of that type, then uh, we drop the prefix mono. So if you think about carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, uh, these are uh, compounds, binary covalent compounds that you already know the names for. And you notice that we don't say monocarbon monoxide or monocarbon dioxide for CO or CO2. Uh, so we, if there's just one of the first element, we just say that element name. If there's more than one, we have to do the prefix. But for the first element named, if there's just one, we just say the element name. If there's more than one, we have the prefix and the element name. For the second name, we always do a prefix and then the root name and then the IDE ending. So that's similar with uh, the IDE ending for ions only now it's the IDE ending on the second element named. So just like metals and nonmetals that form ionic compounds, the two nonmetals that form the covalent compounds, we keep the element name from the first and we give the IDE ending to the second, but we also have prefixes, possibly for the first, unless it's just one, but always for the second. So in the case of um, carbon monoxide. It's not monocarbon monoxide. We don't have the mono prefix for the first, but we do say it for the second. Okay, so looking at some examples. So first of all, we look at the formula and we see here for SBr4 and P2O3. Uh, in each example, we have only nonmetals, so uh, elements from the top right of the table. So we expect to use the uh, covalent nomenclature rules. So these are binary covalent compounds, two nonmetals chemically bound together. Uh, so in the first case, since there's uh, no uh, subscript shown for just the one sulfur in SBr4, notice we don't show the one as a subscript and we don't use mono as a prefix. Uh, if there were any subscript after that first element symbol, uh, then we would have to indicate the prefix as we'll see in the P2O3 example. So there's just one of the sulfurs, and then we see the subscript of four following the bromine uh, element symbol. So there are four bromine uh, atoms bound chemically to one sulfur atom, and therefore uh, the Greek prefix for four is tetra, and the um, bromine being the second element listed will get the brom uh, part of its name kept, and the uh, ene becomes id. So this name, as you see on the screen, is sulfur tetrabromide. No mono for the sulfur, right, and no subscript shown. For the uh, second example, P2O3, now we have subscripts for both the phosphorus and oxygen. The phosphorus is the first element listed, and it has a subscript of 2, so that's di for the prefix. So diphosphorus, and then the oxygen there are three of, but it's the second element name, so instead of oxygen, uh, we'll call it oxide, and uh, noting those prefixes, we have diphosphorus trioxide. So hopefully you'll have plenty of fun on the homework set uh, with the, own, the examples that you have to practice as well. Now as a beginning chemistry student, it might be difficult to uh, determine what's going to be the first atom named and what's going to be the second atom named, especially for these covalent compounds. For the ionic compounds, it's pretty easy. One's typically a metal and one's typically a non-metal, and the metal is named first and the non-metal is named second. But with covalent compounds, uh, the way we determine which atom is named first and second uh, has to do with something called electronegativity. So electronegativity is a measure of an atom's attraction for the electrons within a chemical bond, uh, specifically within a covalent bond. So if we look at the values, uh, we see that they tend to go down uh, as you move down a column. So hydrogen has a, an electronegativity value of 2.1, then we go down to lithium and it drops to 1.0, and sodium 0 0.9, potassium 0 0.8. Uh, and we see that trend preserved throughout. Now if you look at the metals compared with the non-metals, the metals tend to have uh, low electronegativities, typically less than 2 for uh, the metals that we see listed here. Uh, the nonmetals tend to have relatively high electronegativities, uh, two and up uh, 
by and large, although you do see some examples like silicon there in group 4A with 1.8 is slightly less than 2. So these are not hard and fast rules, they're rules of thumb, but they do tend to work most of the time. Uh, we see the most electronegative element, fluorine, with an electronegativity value of 4.0. The noble gases, they're stable. Uh, they don't want uh, to attract electrons toward themselves within a chemical bond because some of them don't even make chemical bonds, uh, and therefore we don't typically list them. So the uh, greatest differences in electronegativity tend to occur between uh, non-metals up and to the right of the table and uh, metals down and to the left. So metals have really low electronegativity values and the nonmetals have relatively high values. If we're talking about a uh, covalent bond, then typically the uh, two nonmetals, the one with the lower electronegativity, so long as it's not hydrogen, uh, is typically um, listed first. And uh, sometimes even hydrogen is listed first, like H2O, but uh, in other compounds like CH4, methane, hydrogen's listed second. So you just have to be careful. Uh, and typically, if we list it for you, then we name it accordingly. But if you were to determine which element would come first and which would come second, it's typically the one with the lower electronegativity, uh, although hydrogen is sometimes a wild card there. Uh, here we see a graphic uh, showing us a polar covalent bond. So when two atoms with differing electronegativities form a bond, those bonding electrons, the shared electron pair between the two atoms, are drawn closer to the atom with the higher electronegativity. Uh, so in this example, we have HCl, hydrogen was 2.1, uh, chlorine's about 3.0. Uh, so the chlorine's the more electronegative, and uh, therefore chlorine is the one that draws the electrons toward itself. It has an unequal sharing, uh, and the chlorine has custody of those electrons more of the time. Hydrogen's maybe an every other weekend type uh, custodian in this sort of bond analogy. So the electrons are shared between the two atoms, but they're not equally shared. Chlorine gets more of them more of the time. Hydrogen gets less of them. And therefore, the chlorine develops a partial negative charge. That's what that delta symbol means, a partial charge uh, around the chlorine that's negative, and therefore a partial positive around the hydrogen. And uh, we call that uh, sort of separation in charge, where it's a polar uh, bond because the uh, bonding electrons are unequally shared, but it's still a molecule. It's not an ionic substance. There's no full positive, full negative charge. We call this a polar covalent bond, and it requires two different elements. If it were chlorine and chlorine or hydrogen and hydrogen, they'd exactly equally shared. It'd be like a tug of war with your identical twin. But when there are two dissimilar elements, uh, then uh, typically one element pulls a little harder, or in this case, a lot harder than the chlorine compared to the hydrogen. So from the previous example, we, we have the HCl left over here, and you see those deltas, the partial positive and partial negative. If you look to the right, there's this new graphic with the NH3, uh, and the NH3 can have the deltas. All the hydrogens get partial positive, that nitrogen gets a partial negative, like you see in uh, part C there at the bottom right, but if you look at the um, mid right, uh, we also see a different type of symbolism that we use, and that's an arrow pointing toward the more electronegative atom, toward the atom that's going to get those electrons within the bond more of the time, uh, and then therefore a plus symbol at the other end. So the arrowhead points toward the more electronegative atom, the one that's going to uh, pull a little harder on those electrons, and the positive end uh, faces out toward the less electronegative atom, uh, which has those electrons less of the time. So that's another convention either to show the deltas or to show the arrows for indicating a polar bond and uh, the direction of the bond polarity, the either partial negative uh, or the arrowhead being toward the more electronegative element. So in the previous slide, we said that if there are any two dissimilar elements, then there is going to be a little difference, at least in electronegativity, and therefore you'd expect a polar bond to resolve. Um, we tend to use the rule of thumb that uh, if the electronegativity difference is small, and arbitrarily we say less than 0.5 electronegativity difference, uh, then we call it a nonpolar covalent type bond, even though it would be uh, 
slightly polar, it's a small enough polarity that we essentially say it's, it's non-polar. Once we hit that 0.5 to 2.0 region of the electronegativity difference, we would call that a polar covalent bond. Again, of the, uh, closer to the 2.0 for the difference, the more polar that covalent bond would be. Uh, and then finally, if there's a, a difference in electronegativity greater than 2.0, we would have what we call an ionic bond. So if you remember back to the uh, graphic of the periodic table with some electronegativity values, sodium has an electronegativity value of 0.9, fluorine has 4.0. So the difference there would be a very great uh, electronegativity difference of 3.1, and we'd call that an ionic compound. Sometimes uh, we have to break these uh, rules of thumb, and uh, HCl was an example we showed. It's a gas at room temperature and pressure. Uh, and it is a molecule, even though it has that very strong electronegativity difference. So sometimes the, the, the rules have to be bent, but for the purpose of this course, if you have an electronegativity difference of less than 0.5, we'll call it nonpolar covalent, even though we understand there's going to be some polarity there. If it's between 0.5 and 2.0, we'll call it polar covalent, and if it's a very great value, let's say 2.0 or greater, we'll call it an ionic Okay, now we get to talk about the really interesting case where you have a group of atoms that are bound in a covalent type fashion, so shared electron bonds, uh, but overall that group has a full positive or full negative charge. Uh, these are what we call polyatomic ions, so they sort of blend covalent and ionic bonding concepts all together. Uh, and we encounter several of these commonly, and we see our table 4.4 there that shows these. Uh, and most of them are anions. The, the two that we consider uh, that are polyatomic cations in this course, the ammonium ion, NH4+, plus, and that has a, a plus one charge. Those NH bonds are uh, polar covalent bonds, but overall there's a uh, positive ch charge of one, making it an ion, so it's a polyatomic. The other instance is the hydronium ion, uh, and this is H3O+. Plus. So again, those OH bonds are polar covalent bonds, but overall there's a net positive one charge. All the other ones that we encounter in this course are negatively charged, and uh, you see the groups that fall into the minus one, minus two, uh, and then that lone phosphate ion, PO4, three minus for a, a polyatomic with three full negative charges. Since we tend to be dealing with the uh, ionic bonding uh, naming rules, uh, we tend not to worry about uh, indicating how many in the name. So for the example below, we see calcium nitrate. There happen to be two nitrates at minus one each to balance the full two positive charge of the calcium ion. But again, the name doesn't use prefixes because overall we treat it like an ionic compound, even though there is some polar covalent bonding uh, within that polyatomic nitrate ion. So when you're writing the formulas, uh, you may have to show the number. Obviously in the name, we didn't show the number, but if you're writing the chemical formula, uh, then you will need to indicate the number of uh, polyatomic ions present. And we do that by putting parentheses around. If there were just one, like in sodium nitrate, NaNO3, we would not have parentheses. Uh, but once we have more than one polyatomic present, uh, we'll put the polyatomic ions formula in parentheses and then a subscript outside that right parenthesis to show the number. So uh, a good trick uh, for figuring out what the subscripts are going to be, if you take the uh, 2 plus there on the calcium ion and the 1 minus on the nitrate ion, and you swap them. So the 2 goes down after the nitrate, the 1 goes down after the calcium, which we don't show because we never show a subscript of 1. And that's a quick and dirty method for getting the uh, overall formula of CaNO3-2. Uh, if you ever had a case where you had, say, a 2-plus ion uh, and a 2-minus polyatomic, uh, then you'd have to look and see if you could divide by some common factor. So in the instance of a calcium 2-plus and a sulfate, SO4-2-minus, it wouldn't be Ca2SO42 because they're each divisible by 2. That would just have the formula of CaSO4. So just uh, be careful about that. Otherwise, you can swap uh, those uh, superscripts of the uh, cation to become the subscript of the anion and uh, superscript of the anion to become the subscript of the cation 
recalling that we never show a 1 as a subscript in either location. And here we have a really neat example where uh, both the cation and the anion are polyatomics, and we just name them in order, uh, cation first, then anion. Uh, so uh, NH42SO4 is the ammonium sulfate formula unit. So uh, again, the NH4 is a plus 1, the SO4 is a 2 minus. We swapped the superscripts for subscripts across, and we got... Uh, the subscript of 2 there uh, in the formula, but again, we don't indicate that with any prefix in the name. Uh, so just plain old ammonium sulfate, not diammonium sulfate. That would be incorrect. So don't mix the rules between uh, the polyatomics uh, or regular binary in organic uh, ionic compounds and the molecular uh, naming rules. So not only are we worried about which do we name first, uh, typically for a molecular substance, the one that we name first is also the central atom. Uh, so it's the one in the center of the uh, molecule in the case of covalent compounds. So uh, if we're going to draw a three-dimensional representation, uh, what we call a Lewis structure, which is really a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional uh, molecular feature, we have to follow these uh, rules to get it just right. So first we count the valence electrons for each atom involved. Uh, then we would sketch a skeletal structure that would connect that central atom, which is typically the first one listed in the name, uh, to all of the peripheral atoms, which would be the second one listed. And then uh, depending, there might be one or more, uh, depending on that subscript following that second element symbol. Uh, so once you've done this, you would place lone pairs around uh, the outer atoms to fulfill the octet rule. Uh, there are a few exceptions uh, to the octet rule, hydrogen being the main one, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Then you'd subtract all those lone pair electrons that you used on the peripheral atoms uh, from the total number of valence electrons to find out how many remaining electrons you have on that central atom. Now don't forget when you made the skeletal structure, you used up two electrons for each line that you drew, so uh, don't forget to subtract those bonding pairs as well. Finally, uh, if you have uh, remaining electrons after you accounted for all the bonding electrons and the lone pairs around the peripheral atoms, uh, then you would put those additional electrons as lone pairs on the central atom. If after doing all of this, your central atom lacks an octet, meaning there's not a total of eight electrons either bonding pairs shown as lines or lone pairs shown as two dots, uh, then you could move uh, one or more lone pairs from one of those peripheral atoms uh, to make a double or a triple bond uh, between that peripheral atom and the central atom in order to give uh, a complete octet to the central atom. Okay, so those are the general rules. Uh, of course, hydrogen uh, can't take an octet. It can only take a duet. Boron, uh, another exception that's happy with a sextet, uh, or it can make an octet in certain circumstances. Uh, and um, aluminum, right, low boron can do the same sort of chemistry. So those are the main exceptions we tend to encounter. The hydrogen uh, atom, its two bonding pair electrons fulfill its valence, uh, and then um, boron and aluminum would uh, have only a sextet. Everything else we tend to see gets an octet, once we get to period three and below, we can have more than an octet on the central atom. Uh, but again, for the purposes of our course, we typically obey the octet rule. So we also have some uh, standard rules for what we expect to see for number of bonds. So for hydrogen, which we already mentioned is an exception to the octet rule, uh, you tend to see it making one bond. Uh, and therefore having the one line off of it and those two electrons in that bond, a one from the hydrogen and one from the central atom, uh, fulfill hydrogen's duet. Helium doesn't make bonds, so we don't need to worry about the number of bonds it would make. Carbon uh, tends to make four bonds, uh, either four single bonds like we see here uh, in the case of CH4 or um, some mix of single and double bonds or single and triple bond or uh, things like that with carbon, so four bonds total. Nitrogen tends to make three bonds total uh, and have a lone pair, uh, as we see uh, in the Lewis symbol. Oxygen tends to make two bonds and have two lone pairs, although, as we saw, the polyatomic H3O plus 
Uh, that's an exception to that rule, just like the polyatomic NH4 plus has nitrogen making four bonds. Uh, when we violate these typical bonding patterns, like three for nitrogen and two for oxygen, that's when we tend to get those formal charges, those uh, full ch uh, plus charge for NH4, the full plus charge for H3O plus, for instance. Fluorine, uh, all of group seven really, especially fluorine, tend to make only one bond, uh, just like hydrogen does, although fluorine does have three lone pairs, whereas hydrogen doesn't being uh, a period one element. And then finally, we see chlorine looking just like fluorine, one bonding pair, three lone pairs. Um, chlorine can do other chemistry. Fluorine really is pretty restricted to that uh, single bonding pair. Occasionally, you'll encounter molecules that have an odd number of electrons. So that's not going to be possible to get bonding pairs and lone pairs uh, if you have an odd number. Uh, so when you have an atom or a molecule with an unpaired electron, we call that a free radical. And these tend to be very reactive species. So we see the example uh, nitrogen monoxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, chlorine dioxide. Uh, these are, are substances that uh, have an odd number of valence electrons and therefore a, a singlet electron instead of a lone pair. Uh, on one of the atoms, usually the central atom, uh, and that causes it to be relatively unstable. Uh, in uh, human health, uh, you tend to hear a lot about free radical damage to cells. These uh, free radical species tend to be fairly short-lived. NO is an important cell signaler, uh, so uh, sometimes it's necessary to have them, uh, but typically uh, they're undesirable and uh, they, they do uh, become associated with damage to cells and uh, therefore, people will uh, do things like take mega doses of vitamin C uh, to uh, help to um, alleviate the damage due to free radicals by giving them something to uh, steal an electron from, like a vitamin C uh, molecule. So going from these uh, Lewis structures to molecular shapes, uh, one way to do that is what's known as VSEPR theory, uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion. Some people call it Vesper, but if you look at it, it really should be Vesper. Uh, so we'll just call it VSEPR, uh, and it predicts the shape of molecules and, or, and polyatomic ions, which are, are molecules with full positive or negative charges, uh, based on the repulsion of those electron pairs on the central atom. So electrons repel each other. Uh, we, we have the electron pairs because of the different spin directions, so those electrons are okay near each other. Uh, but one electron pair will repel another electron pair, and so the central atom wants to have all those bonding and lone pair electrons as far away from each other as three-dimensional space will allow uh, to minimize the electron-electron repulsion. Uh, so we'll look and see how that results in common bonding shapes by uh, maximizing 3D space and keeping those bonding and lone pairs away from each other to the extent that uh, three-dimensional space will allow. All right, so if we have a central atom that has uh, two bonding partners and no lone pairs, the best way in three-dimensional shape to uh, minimize electron-electron repulsion and have those uh, two bonding groups as far away from each other is to make a, a straight line, a linear-type molecule, 180-degree uh, bond distance separation. If we look at the middle column, now we have three electron sets. Uh, and the best way to uh, maximize 3D space there is to have those uh, three electron groups uh, set apart at 120 degree angles. Uh, and then finally, if we have four electron groups, uh, now uh, you've got to think more than uh, two-dimensional. Two-dimensional, you might think uh, a square would be a good way to go, but of course we've got three-dimensional uh, space to work with, so we find the tetrahedron to be the optimal way to keep those electron groups, those four electron groups around the central atom, uh, from repelling each other. So uh, don't think uh, flat for everything. Linear, trigonal planar, those make sense in a two-dimensional setting, uh, but you've got to think 3D when we get to four electron pairs uh, and uh, come upon our tetrahedron. That tetrahedral arrangement is very important for the organic and biochemistry component of the course because uh, carbon uh, typically takes on tetrahedral geometry, and carbon's the basis for organic and biochemistry. 
now we see here a list of uh, common shapes. So if we think of uh, two atoms bonded to a central atom, uh, we have uh, that linear arrangement. And some examples would be BeCl2, so beryllium being so high in the table, even though it's in with the alkaline earth metals, uh, it tends to do a lot of covalent chemistry because it has such a high electronegativity for a metal. Uh, and so that's why we see things like BeCl2, um, CO2, uh, another example. Again, those electron sets now are double bonds in CO2, but still two electron groups around a central atom. So it still gets that linear arrangement, HCN, HGCl2, or some other examples that uh, our table lists. Let's move up to three bonded groups, no lone pairs. As we said in the previous slide, that would be uh, 120 degree bond angles. This gives what we call a trigonal planar geometry. Uh, boron trifluoride uh, is an example of this. And again, boron is one of our examples that's an exception to the octet rule. So notice that boron has just six electrons around itself, two in each of those bonding groups, uh, and it's happy. Uh, so boron is one of our exceptions. Aluminum, again, you see aluminum tribromide there is another example. Aluminum is another exception. For the CH2O, uh, that uh, formaldehyde uh, molecule, uh, we would have, again, the C double bonded to the O, and then a C single bonded to each of the hydrogens. So the carbon does have an octet by making that double bond with the oxygen. The oxygen also has an octet, two lone pairs, and the, the double bond. So a total of uh, eight electrons around the oxygen and the carbon, two electrons around each of the hydrogen, which is an exception to the octet rule, just like boron or aluminum. Looking at the tetrahedral case, four uh, bonded atoms around a central atom, so four electron groups, and we see carbon uh, and methane, CH4, carbon and carbon tetrabromide, CBr4, silicon, right below carbon in the periodic table, does very similar chemistry here in silicon tetrafluoride. Uh, and again, these are all tetrahedral arrangements with the carbon or silicon being the central atom and those other, uh, in the case of hydrogen, just the bonding pair. In the case of bromine or chlorine, uh, octets with the bonding pair making two of the electrons and then three lone pairs uh, to give each an octet. If we talk about some deviations from that, what if we replace some of those uh, bonding pairs with lone pairs? So if we have a total of three uh, bonding uh, three groups around the central atom uh, as one lone pair for a total of four electron sets. Well, we're going to still be a tetrahedral uh, arrangement of all the electrons, but since one of those uh, electron groups is a lone pair, we don't have a perfectly tetrahedral molecule anymore. We have now what we call trigonal pyramidal. So it's like a pyramid, uh, and it would be uh, an example of something like that would be NH3, where you have still a lone pair on hydrogen so that the electrons are arranged in a tetrahedron but the molecule which is based only on the bonding groups is what we call trigonal pyramidal. Uh, PCL3 is another example. If we go ahead and replace another bonding pair with another lone pair now we still have four total electron groups and those electrons are all arranged in the tetrahedron uh, but two of the positions in the tetrahedron are lone pairs and two are bonding pairs we call this a bent molecule. Uh, and so this is why something like H2O is bent, whereas CO2 is linear. Uh, so uh, it's very important that uh, water has that bent geometry because it, it's a polar molecule. If it were linear, it would be nonpolar, and, and things would be very, very different. Uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide, another example of a bent molecule, SCl2 being a third example that our table lists. And then finally, if we have uh, two bonded atoms and one lone pair, uh, we have three electron groups around the central atom, and we'd form that trigonal planar electron geometry. But again, since only two of those groups are uh, bonding uh, partners, uh, actual peripheral atoms, uh, we wouldn't have a trigonal planar molecule. We'd have another example of a bent molecule, uh, and we see SO2 being the example here. So SO2 is going to be bent just like H2O is bent, but the bond angle in SO2 is going to be greater closer to 120 degrees, whereas the bond angle in H2O is going to be smaller, uh, more like 109.5 or even actually less. Uh, in any example where we have lone pairs on a central atom, 
those bonding pairs get compressed. So water is actually more like 104.5 and SO2 is more like 118 or so uh, degrees. So thinking back a while now in this chapter, we talked about the idea of polar bonds and we said that when there's an electronegativity difference between uh, two atoms in the bond of uh, between say 0.5 and uh, 2.0, uh, that's what we call the polar bond. Now, just because we have polar bonds doesn't always mean we'll get polar molecules. But, on the other hand, we can't have a polar molecule without polar bonds. So the conditions that we have to meet to have polar molecules, they have to have polar bonds, and the bonds must be arranged so that a separation of charge exists. What we mean by this is we can't have uh, one polar bond in one direction canceled by another polar bond in another direction. Okay, so we see here uh, the example of uh, CH4, methane, uh, and again, those are all slightly polar bonds. Uh, they don't quite meet our uh, guidelines of what our book calls a polar bond because the hydrogen's uh, about 2.1 uh, and the carbon's, again, uh, 2.5. So it's only a 0.4 difference, but again, that is uh, a difference, and if we were being rigorous, these would be considered polar bonds, but you see they all cancel each other. Uh, the uh, arrowheads uh, are pointing all toward the carbon, uh, and so you're getting that uh, outside uh, looking all the same. So it's uh, polar bonding, but a nonpolar molecule. For our purposes, actually, our book would say that's not even a polar bond, so it couldn't be a polar molecule, and we'd still get the right answer that CH4 is treated nonpolar in terms of its molecular polarity. If we look at now instead of CH4, if we look at NH3, which is similar, it's, it's still based on a tetrahedron in terms of the four electron groups, but now one of those groups is a lone pair on the central atom. Uh, we see we don't have the net cancellation anymore. All of the uh, bases of our tetrahedron, those NH bonds, they're all polar, they're all pointing up toward the nitrogen, and therefore if we look in at uh, graphic C there, we see we have a net buildup of negative charge up at the um, nitrogen end. It's not a full negative charge. This is still a neutral molecule, but it has a partial negative building up at the nitrogen and partial positives building up at the hydrogen ends. So here we have a polar bond, right? So the nitrogen's 3.0 um, minus the, the hydrogen's 2.1 gives a bond polarity of an electronegativity difference of 0.9, which does make it a polar bond, according to our text, uh, and those polar bonds aren't canceled out completely. They, they build up along that nitrogen for a partial negative and partial positives along the uh, hydrogen ends. So this is indeed a polar molecule made up of polar bonds, and that's why if you've ever gone to the a grocery store uh, to buy aqueous ammonia. It's a great cleaner, good on glass and other surfaces. Uh, it dissolves really well in water, which is going to be our next polar molecule. Okay, and as promised, here we see a water molecule. Again, that central atom of oxygen uh, has its four electron groups around itself in a tetrahedral arrangement. But since two of those groups are lone pairs and, and the other two are bonding pairs, now we get uh, that bent arrangement. Uh, so H2O, uh, you might think that it would be in a straight line like CO2. It's not. It's a case where uh, we have that uh, polarity to the bond, the OH bond, big polarity, right? 3.5 electronegativity value for oxygen, 2.1 for hydrogen, so 1.4 electronegativity difference. So quite a polar bond. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the, the oxygen end is getting that uh, partial negative charge, it's getting the electrons more of the time. Uh, the partial positives are building up along the hydrogen ends, so it's it's a neutral molecule, but it's very uh, big separation of charge and a very polar molecule. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, polar molecules tend to like other polar molecules. So NH3 dissolves really well in H2O uh, to give us our uh, cleanser, aqueous ammonia. Uh, if we think back to the CH4 that we saw a couple slides ago, that does not dissolve very well in water. Uh, it's because it's nonpolar, uh, it tends to bubble right out through water. Uh, and uh, that's a good thing, especially as we consider natural gas drilling, uh, 
what's going on in Pennsylvania versus what could happen in New York. And uh, it's, it's good uh, that we wouldn't worry about a buildup of uh, methane in our gas, but a, a small amount could dissolve. And uh, again, there were problems initially with um, natural gas uh, coming out of the water and uh, stories where you'd see uh, the water being flammable because of that little bit of uh, CH4 that was um, escaping from the, the water. Uh, because it didn't really like to be dissolved in the water. Okay, so that discussion leads us right into our green chemistry concept for the chapter. Uh, by understanding chemical bonding, molecular geometries, and intermolecular forces, uh, we can design and develop new medicines, molecules, and materials that benefit society and also have minimal impact on the environment and human health. Uh, so, um, an example here might be the decaffeination of coffee. Uh, the uh, coffee beans are decaffeinated in the green state, the unroasted state, uh, and it's a pretty challenging process because you want to remove the caffeine um, but leave the thousand or so other uh, chemical compounds that are important to the coffee uh, intact. Uh, the earliest attempt at decaffeinating coffee involved the use of benzene, to remove the caffeine, and uh, this is obviously undesirable. Benzene is uh, either a known carcinogen or cancer suspect agent, depending on what state you live in. California knows that it's a carcinogen, for instance, uh, and it's also pretty tough to remove at the end. Uh, so that's been abandoned. Um, dichloromethane, or methane chloride, as it's also known, uh, is still in use, although that's uh, on the EPA's list of cancer suspect agents. Um, although very little is left behind, uh, part per million quantities, but still um, there is the um, likelihood that there's a little bit left over. Uh, so one of the newest methods uh, is to use supercritical CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, a polar bond, right? That CO bond is definitely polar, carbon having an electronegativity of 2.5, oxygen having an electronegativity of 3.5 gives a 1.0 electronegativity difference. But because it's the linear arrangement, right, the C double bonded to O uh, on uh, either side of that 180 degree linear molecule, uh, you get a, a nonpolar molecule because the two polar bonds cancel each other. So this nonpolar molecule uh, doesn't do much in the gas phase, but as a supercritical fluid, uh, it does a really nice job of selectively removing the caffeine from the coffee uh, and uh, nothing else. It's pretty much selective for caffeine, so it leaves all the other uh, compounds uh, intact, that nice uh, rich aroma that you want from the coffee without the little bit of stimulant from the caffeine. Uh, and it's also uh, very environmentally friendly uh, because at the end you can just remove the caffeine and reclaim the CO2 and go through and do this whole process again. So uh, you benefit human health if someone uh, should not ha be having caffeine. Pregnant women, for instance, shouldn't have a lot of caffeine or others with certain health conditions. Uh, so uh, you remove the caffeine from the coffee uh, and benefited those uh, people who uh, really can't uh, tolerate caffeine. Uh, and you've also done it in a very environmentally friendly way compared to the old uh, benzene or even the methylene chloride approaches. Okay, so another really dense chapter, lots packed in, lots of ideas packed in here. So before we uh, wrap things up, uh, we're just going to uh, do a brief review of some of that chemical vocabulary. So we have names, uh, and again, here's a common name, ammonia. If we were to give its official name, it's, it's a binary molecular compound. So we would uh, have to name it as uh, nitrogen trihydride or trihydrogen nitride, mononitride is uh, another way we could do it depending on which we want to name first. Um, so probably uh, we would name it uh, trihydrogen uh, mononitride preferably uh, because of the reasons we talked about. Uh, but the chemical formula uh, NH3 and then the Lewis formula, the Lewis dot diagram that we can draw from that, you see a lone pair on the nitrogen as well as single bonds to each of the hydrogens. Uh, and recalling that that electron geometry would be a tetrahedron. Since we've replaced one point with a lone pair, now we're at a molecular geometry that we would call trigonal parameter. So lots packed in, lots of ideas packed into this chapter. Uh, but again, hopefully uh, 
as you uh, practice these concepts and, and get more familiar with them and get used to the conventions, you'll feel more comfortable and you'll have a much greater understanding of chemistry uh, in everyday uh, world and uh, also chemistry as it uh, relates to your particular interest, why you're in this course uh, in the first place.